Yesterday, the Catholic Church released a landmark, unprecedented, and downright blasphemous document that radically alters church teaching on same-sex marriage. At least, that's how the media is portraying it. The reality is much less interesting and not really that controversial. There is definitely something to take from yesterday's document, but it actually doesn't change much from what is already happening in a lot of places. Let's dive into what the church actually said. Even before the document begins, Cardinal Fernandez, the prefect of the CDF, offers an important explanatory note. This declaration remains firm on the traditional doctrine of the church about marriage, not allowing any type of liturgical rite or blessing similar to the liturgical rite that can create confusion. Quoting Pope Francis, the document affirms that marriage is strictly defined as the exclusive, stable, and indissoluble union between a man and a woman naturally open to the generation of children. The church's stance on marriage has not changed even in the slightest. Rather, the question at stake here is not how the church defines marriage or who can get married, a question that has long been settled, but rather an understanding of what we mean by blessing something. Which is actually a more nuanced question than you might think at first. Think about it for a second. If you're with other people, pause the video and see if you come to the same definition. Chances are you won't because there are at least two related yet distinct understandings of what it means to bless something. Biblically speaking, the document points out, blessings often come from God as a sign of favor with someone, an endorsement of one's behavior with special treatment. But they are just as often seen as a means of strengthening others, offering guidance and giving praise back to God. Throughout the Bible, people ask for and give blessings, not intended as a reward, but because they are in need of help. And so it has been for the history of the church, two related yet distinct understandings of blessing. There is, on the one hand, liturgical blessings, formal, ritualized ways to acknowledge the fruit that God has produced in someone as a way to promote further growth in faith. These blessings, then, are a clear endorsement of one's life in God, a means of praising what God is working through them. For this to be true, the Church affirms in this document that this type of blessing requires that what is blessed be conformed to God's will. You cannot endorse evil or morally depraved things, as this would be a contradiction in terms. God does not endorse that which is against God's will. Thus, the document clearly states, the church does not have the power to confer its liturgical blessing when that would somehow offer a form of moral legitimacy to a union that presumes to be a marriage or to an extramarital sexual practice. If our understanding of blessing is simply one of endorsement, there is no room for blessing irregular or same-sex marriages. But that is not the only way that we understand blessings, and the point of this document is to remind us of what we already know and practice, that blessings can also be a means of strengthening, protection, guidance, and purification for those who have not yet found their way completely to God. Think about the things we bless and why we bless them. We bless the elderly, the sick, participants in catechetical meetings, pilgrims, those traveling, volunteer groups, and so on. In doing so, we do not presume their holiness or worthiness of God's favor, but rather look to them precisely because they are in need of God's favor. There is a danger, Pope Francis warns us, that blessings will be subjected to too many moral prerequisites, which, under the claim of control, could overshadow the unconditional power of God's love that forms the basis for the gesture of blessing. In other words, a danger that only those who are perfect will ever receive the help they need. The ones who recognize themselves as sinners and ask for help will be sent away to deal with their problems alone. Expecting people to be well disposed and in good standing with the church in order to receive the sacraments makes perfect sense as the stakes are a bit higher. The sacraments confer the very presence of God. But is that really necessary for a simple blessing? If someone comes asking God for help, wanting a priest or minister to pray over them to help them live a good life, is there ever a condition that we could, in good conscience, send them away? Pope Francis strongly believes that the answer is no. When people ask for a blessing, an exhaustive moral analysis should not be placed as a precondition for conferring it. When one asks for a blessing, one's expressing a petition for God's assistance, a plea to live better, and confidence in a Father who can help us live better. This request should, in every way, be valued, accompanied, and received with gratitude. This is not an endorsement of one's irregular relationship. It's actually the complete opposite. Blessings in these situations are given, the Church writes, so that human relationships may mature and grow in fidelity to the Gospel, that they may be freed from their imperfections and frailties, and that they may express themselves in the ever-increasing dimension of the divine love. We bless people, not irregular relationships, for the very purpose of drawing them out of sin to a more perfect life in God. So, how do we do this? The Church tells us to keep two things in mind. First, it should be simple and spontaneous. 
As soon as these blessings become formal, ritualized, or even liturgical, they begin to bear a stronger weight and risk causing confusion. This is not a sacrament of the church, and this is not something the church endorses. When it comes to blessings, the church has the right and the duty to avoid any rite that might contradict this conviction or lead to confusion. Which leads to the second point, which is that these blessings are never to be done in connection with a civil union ceremony. It is not a good idea for a priest to show up at a same-sex wedding, to offer a blessing at the end of the ceremony, to include a prayer as a regular part of the process, or to offer a blessing with any clothing, gestures, or words that are proper to a wedding. To do so could too easily be confused with legitimizing the marriage, which is not the point of this blessing. The point of this blessing, the document clearly states, is to open one's life to God, to ask for his help to live better, and also to invoke the Holy Spirit so that the values of the gospel may be lived with greater faithfulness. It's about blessing people, not relationships. It's about blessing people who find themselves in situations that are not in perfect alignment with God's will, but seek God's help and direction. For me, paragraph 33 says it all. God never turns away anyone who approaches him. Ultimately, a blessing offers people a means to increase their trust in God. The request for a blessing thus expresses and nurtures openness to the transcendence, mercy, and closeness to God in a thousand concrete circumstances of life, which is no small thing in the world in which we live. It is a seed of the Holy Spirit that must be nurtured, not hindered. As much as the media and some Catholic culture warriors want to stir this up as something controversial or depict it as a major shift in church teaching, I just don't see it. The church's stance on marriage has not changed nor has its approach to caring for people. What Pope Francis is doing is what he has spent his entire papacy doing, calling us to pastorally approach those on the margins, not to change the church to fit the world, but to better reach, listen to, accompany, and ultimately welcome the world to the church. This is a mission that gets my blessing.